Because the goal is not to completely subjugate Afghanistan. The goal is to use Afghanistan to wash money out of the tax bases of the United States, out of the tax bases of European countries, through Afghanistan and back into the hands of a transnational security elite. That is the goal, i.e. the goal is to have an endless war, not a successful war. That was uh, Julian Assange at the very top, talking about the war in Afghanistan, and it pretty much speaks for itself. And by the way, that was 2010. And if only people had listened and heeded what he was saying, perhaps we could have saved tens of thousands of lives, mostly civilians, and a, a trillion and a half dollars, if not more. I'm Randy Credico. This is Randy Credico live on the fly with another exclusive Assange Countdown to Freedom on the Progressive Radio Network. Also, you can see this on the Rokefin channel later on in the day. After you hear this, you may want to see it. Go to Rokefin. We have uh, two special guests today. Uh, we have the father of Julian Assange, uh, John Shipton joining us from Australia on the second half. And on the first half, we have Rebecca Vincent, who is the director of international campaigns for Reporters Without Borders. You really want to hear what she has to say. Um, just want to make a few announcements here. Um, first of all, on October 1st, the Donziger uh, sentencing takes place there on 500 Pearl Street. Be there at eight o'clock in the morning. We've done a couple of shows on him. Eight o'clock in the morning, federal uh, courthouse on 500 Pearl Street. That's one. Another one, I'm excited about this. I was just in DC uh, setting up the first of two, a two city tour of what's going to be called or is called Stand Ups for Assange. And it's me and Lee Camp and some others. I don't want to tell you who they are right yet. Uh, I will over the next couple of weeks. These uh, shows will fill up quickly. So uh, I will tell you about it more over the next couple of weeks. Uh, this is a, uh, a small tour that's being organized by Assange Countdown to Freedom, also by Courage Foundation and NYC Free Assange. On today's show, a uh, special treat for you, my dear friend and the dear friend to Assange Countdown to Freedom, uh, Niels Melzer, the special rapporteur on torture, uh, has given us some very nice pieces of music that we're going to play between now and uh, to the end of the show. Uh, so uh, let's get right to it. We're going to go to Rebecca Vincent. After this little piece of music, by Niels Melzer, it's called Letting Go, and we'll be right back with Rebecca Vincent. Uh, Nils Melzer in his original piece, Letting Go. 
I'm Randy Credico, Randy Credico, live on the fly, Assange Countdown to Freedom here on the Progressive Radio Network. And uh, later on, uh, this uh, wonderful radio interview that we're doing today with both my next guest and later with uh, John Shipton, the father of Julian Assange, will be seen uh, in a number of places, Rockfin, uh, AssangeCountdownToFreedom.com, uh, RadioCredico.com, uh, and many other platforms. Uh, but uh, let me get to the guest. That was Nils Melzer, by the way. He does play the piano, and today we're going to play a lot of his music uh, interstitially and at the end. Uh, joining us right now, as I said in the uh, opening, is Rebecca Vinson, who I met in Belmorris at the first half of the Assange trial, our extradition hearing. And uh, she was uh, there and busy, and uh, she's been on it, uh, I think, even prior to that and working. She's been at every different uh, aspect of this uh, case. And uh, she is the director of international campaigns for Reporters Without Borders, also known at, internationally as Reporters Sans Frontiers or uh, Peradistas Sin Fronteras. And she's also the, um, the uh, main person, the, uh, the director in London for our, the UK for uh, Reporters Without Borders. And uh, welcome, Rebecca, back. This is your third appearance uh, last year, earlier, I think, uh, or late last year and now. And a lot of stuff has transpired. Good seeing you again. It's good to see you, Randy, in the nice warm environment, not outside Belmarsh queuing to get into a courtroom. That was cold. It was cold. Very and we had cold. to get there early. They made it difficult. They made it difficult for us. We had to get there at five o'clock in the morning, wait for three hours and only let 24 of us in. And at one point, when I first met you, you had a difficult time getting in. That's like you would think with the credentials and, and, and the uh, international reputation of uh, Reporters Without Borders that you would just be, you know, given the green light without having to go through the rigmarole. Have you ever gone well, through that before? Never. Um, in fact, my, myself and my colleagues, this was the most difficult to access hearing of anything that we've monitored in any country. Um, the district judge, Vanessa Barrett, so basically refused to accept that NGOs had a legitimate reason for being there. She didn't see us as having any different role from the public. So unlike media, which could get accredited to the, to the hearing as professional NGO observers, we were not. However, I will have to say that um, in the preliminary appellate hearing that just took place a few weeks ago, the, the high court took a different view and did accredit us. And I had an assigned seat in court, was able to do my job like a professional. Um, and frankly, that's how we should have been treated the entire time. I'm hoping that that will be how the high court continues to, uh, to interact with NGO observers throughout these proceedings now. I did, well, let's go back before we go into this, uh, the Assange case. I want to, so people know, it, it, Reporters Without Borders or uh, Reporters Assange Frontiers has been around for about 35 years. Just give us an overview uh, of their genesis and the kind of work that they have done over the last three and a half decades. Sure, we we defend press freedom globally. We we defend freedom of information in, in the kind of French sense of that, which means the the freedom to inform and to be informed. Um, and so that means you know we campaign in cases all around the world. It can be cases of imprisonment like this one. It can be uh, campaigning for justice for journalists um, who have been murdered. Uh, campaigning for better protections for journalists. We provide really concrete assistance sometimes, like we lend flak jackets and helmets to freelancers. Um, we can help sometimes. Uh, to evacuate journalists from difficult situations, resettle them somewhere safer, the whole range of sort of activities that you think of as uh, promoting and defending press freedom and journalism. And, and, and they work with a lot of big, uh, well-respected organizations like uh, United Nations and UNESCO. My yep. friend. Certainly, we engage in advocacy with all of those bodies and with governments directly, including the governments at the epicenter of this case, the US and UK. Right. And so, but it hasn't been easy, this case. I mean, uh, all the years that you've been uh, with uh, Reporters Without Borders, um, would, would you say that uh, this has been the most challenging one for you to monitor? 
Um, so in terms of accessing court, certainly it was the most difficult and also doing it during a pandemic. At times, we also had trouble with police outside of the courtroom, which just threw another level of complications. Um, in terms of a campaign, because uh, I am responsible for the, our global campaign to free Assange, I would say it has been one of the more challenging cases in terms of trying to effectively mobilize the public. Um, and I found that in many countries there's a there's more sympathy for Assange there's a you know sort of more of a public understanding of uh, the reasons he's been targeted and the the principles at stake it's been more challenging in the countries responsible for this the US and UK I don't think that's a coincidence I think it's um it's very clear that there has been a concerted attempt by some to paint him in a certain light it has largely proven effective so as campaigners that's made our job a bit trickier to uh, to make sure that the public focuses on the reasons he's been targeted the precedent this could set um, we need to see more pressure by the publics on our own governments. If there were more pressure in this case, I don't believe that our states would get away with what they're doing. Right. You know, some of his uh, detractors, particularly in, in, in uh, mainstream media, some of the big outlets, uh, don't uh, describe him or refer to him as a journalist. There's no mistake about it uh, with RFS that he is a, a serious journalist and WikiLeaks is a serious publication. Well, what I would say is, because um, I think that has also been an argument that's been used to distract from the, the the core issues too. I would say it doesn't actually matter if one considers him a journalist because it's undeniable that he has been targeted for publishing information in the public interest, right? So whether or not that label applies to him, various organizations have different criteria. Um, he's a publisher. He is also in many ways a journalistic source. So it's a, it's a little complex, but it doesn't matter if you look at why he's been targeted. In every case, it's not about who somebody is, but why they've been targeted. And we are 100% convinced that Julian Assange was targeted for publishing this information, which informed public interest reporting around the world. That is really important for journalism. And anyone who thinks that this will stop with Julian Assange, if he, if, if the U.S. successfully extradites him and prosecutes him there, this could apply to any publisher, any journalist, any source. We could see many more cases like this in the future. That That is the big alarm, is that the implications of, of a successful extradition, not just the, a successful extradition, just the process, what he's gone through uh, to be uh, here's a guy who's a brilliant man, he's nonviolent, and he's been ensconced in this medieval dungeon-like prison uh, there in Belmores for two years, two, two and, and a half years, uh, and eight years before that in the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, what do you say about putting someone like that in these conditions, who is trying to defend himself? What is your view on that and the RSF's view on, on the way he's being treated uh, mm -hmm. aside from the espionage act uh, charges mm -hmm. just uh, your views on, on on the treatment alone well sure well his targeting has certainly already had a chilling effect i think that was the intention of it very few people would be willing to put themselves at risk for you know that sort of uh, period that he faced in the embassy which the un working group on arbitrary detention has declared was arbitrary detention let alone prison time um so we will never know already what stories have not come out because of uh the way that he has been singled out um, targeted really to make an example of him. Currently, we have serious concerns about his well-being, his physical and mental health, because um, the, the court actually ruled against extradition on the basis of his mental health and then turned around and decided to keep him detained while the, the US pursues its appeal, despite the fact that prolonged periods of detention will exacerbate the very mental health issues, which are the reason that the court found he shouldn't be extradited to the US. Uh, so we're concerned because he is a very vulnerable individual in that regard. We heard days of testimony about the state of his mental health and physically as well. It's been worth noting he has some pre-existing physical health conditions, which made him very susceptible to COVID. At times, COVID in fact, Actions were really rampant in Belmarsh prison. There was a period where he was held um, almost de facto in solitary confinement, unable to leave his cell because there were so many COVID infections around him on his wing of the prison. So that, that lends a sense of humanitarian urgency for the need for his release. But we also believe that he shouldn't be detained full stop. He should be released. This case should be closed. The US should not continue to pursue its appeal. Um, but it, so far, every indication that we've seen is that um, it looks like the Biden Department of Justice is going to barrel ahead and pursue this until the bitter end. Yes, I, and, and it's, it's troubling because uh, under the Obama administration, they decided 
uh, Matt Miller, the spokesperson, said if 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 uh, we go after Assange, then we'd have to go after the New York Times. We'd have to go after uh, the L.A. Times and the Wall Street Journal and uh, MSNBC or NBC uh, for publishing uh, the same material. If they were back then, that's what he said. He was the Justice Department spokesperson that was under Obama and Biden. So don't you find it uh, bizarre that Biden is picking up where Trump left off on this case? We think it's a major missed opportunity. We had called on the Biden Department of Justice shortly after his inauguration to simply close the case. That would have been the most straightforward way out of this. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Um, and that really calls into question this administration's seriousness about um, its stated commitments when it comes to human rights and free expression. So we continue to advocate for the US to reconsider its position and to close this case. Um, but you're absolutely right. All of these media outlets have, have published information uh, have published stories that again were in the public interest uh, as uh, uh, you know um, um, based on the the leaked documents it's worth noting also that other websites that had published uh, the unredacted cables as well none have ever been pursued by the US government only WikiLeaks and so it's very clearly selective targeting here we have to ask why and we have to ask what the implications will be going forward and I I fear the very worst. When you look as well at other ongoing trends, we have moves in the UK uh, to reform the official secrets acts in a way that would make it even easier for our government to pursue people in this way here. There is a really worrying trend uh, in many countries now that seems intended to silence national security reporting in particular. What do you think, uh, who, who is the hidden hand behind all of this? I mean, I, I think Biden is just going along with whatever, whatever his uh, advisors are top uh, institutional security state, uh, uh, you know, had to say uh, for him to do it. It just seems like he's he's not concerned about this case in particular, but somebody else is. And I don't know the genesis and where to locate it, but it seems like there's somebody that he has angered so badly that Biden's not going to gainsay or confute what they want to do. Well, President Biden certainly has the power to make this stop. And I think that's what we would focus on is calling on him to close the case. Whoever is responsible for this within the Department of Justice now, um, they have this this power. We, there, this is this is not inevitable. This is not sort of something that has to be pursued in the in the way that they've chosen to. At any point, the case could be closed. There's many practical arguments for doing such, not just political arguments. But one thing I would emphasize is that it really damages the U.S. Uh, reputation on these issues. When when we see um, in other ways this administration trying to turn away from some of the legacies of the Trump administration, trying to make the U.S. a voice for human rights for all of these things again in the world, this case is a thorn in their side. The best thing that they could do would be to close it to signal that this is the end of that era that enough is enough um nothing can be undone here even if he were released tomorrow he has still been deprived of his liberty all this time and again what he's gone through already were, has already had a chilling effect and may do regardless of what happens next but what we can focus on is the next best thing which is to stop this now to not take it any further a, lo a lot of damage has been done not only to him as nils melcher said psychologically mm -hmm. physically in there but uh, the uh, chilling effect and uh, the fact that he hasn't been able to practice journalism uh, for more than three years, the last year that he was in the embassy, he was cut off. And the two and a half years he's been in Belmorris, he has been cut off. WikiLeaks is not getting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, troves of uh, different uh, secret documents or new information to put out there. I think people are afraid to, to, convey or to put through the transom any new stuff, revelations that they could uh, distill and put out there. Um, but but I, I'd like to go back to you witness. I was there. I was astounded with what I saw going back to February uh, 24th through the 28th that week in uh, Belmores. Give, give us your, your thoughts about that, that aspect and then all the way up to the appeal uh, a couple of weeks back. Sure. Uh, well, the week that you joined us um, there at, at Belmarsh Prison, the court just near Belmarsh is, is Woolwich Crown Court. So what we witnessed that week were, was basically both sides setting out their legal arguments. Um, what we commented on from Reporters Without Borders at the time was that the, the way that the arguments were presented that week really underscored the lack of evidence that the U.S. government had for the case it was pursuing, for the claims that it was making about Julian Assange. 
Then in September, we returned for a full month of proceedings at the Old Bailey, uh, the Central Criminal Court in London, where we faced even way tougher restrictions on, on access, I have to I have to note. So a lot of my, my day was spent trying to just fight my way into court each day. It was very difficult. Um, we were able to monitor uh, most of the proceedings. We got in for some part at least of each day with the help of uh, a group of grassroots activists and others that were really helping us to get into court each day since the judge wouldn't just accredit us as she should have. Um, but what we witnessed then was the evidence. And so again, that underscored that, you know, the, the severity of Julian Assange's mental health in particular, it, it really um, showed that although the US is making claims such as he knowingly put sources at risk, um, we heard how, in fact, publication was outside of his control and that he had um, really done everything possible at the time to try to mitigate the risk to any individuals that would be named. Um, we heard evidence on all of these aspects that really, in our view, the, the defense position was strong. Um, the concern that we had then with the decision that came out on the 4th of Janu January, although of course we welcome the fact that the decision was against extradition, we criticized the substance of the ruling because it did not take a strong stance on the aspects that we're concerned about uh, related to journalism, to press freedom. The judge refused to acknowledge that this case is about those things. Um, and she largely accepted the prosecution's argument on the substantive issues um, that were examined. So in fact, when I, when I was sitting there in the courtroom that day, I got into, we, we queued in winter temperatures from about 4 a.m. that day and argued with police for hours who were threatening to arrest us to get in that day. Um, so I was in the overflow courtroom and as we were listening to the decision being read, until it suddenly turned at the end, it very much felt like the decision was going to be for extradition. So it was a relief that it wasn't in the end. Two days later, we were back at a different court, the Westminster Magistrates Court, where she decided to reject his bail application and he's remained in detention ever since. So then not, not much happened um, between January and then August. Um, but a few weeks ago in August, we there was a two hour, well, it ended up being a little more than that. It was a scheduled two hour hearing on the 11th of August. That was just a preliminary part of the appeal hearing. Um, the US had a minor victory in um, arguing successfully to expand the grounds that the court will consider in the actual appeal. Um, I think the media coverage I saw of that was a bit skewed. It seemed like like Assange had had lost this big battle. That's not what happened that day. It was it was simply that the U.S. government convinced the judge that that some additional points were arguable. This was mostly related to the testimony of one of the medical experts. Um, so now on the 27th and 28th of October, uh, we will return to the substantive portion of that hearing. The US will be able to, to pursue its appeal on five separate grounds. Um, and in two days of, of, uh, of court time has been scheduled for that. So we intend to be back. And I very much hope that we will be accredited again and, and allocated a seat to, to observe those proceedings. Right, so, so what happens if, if they, one, they, how long does it take for them to render their decision? How long, what would happen either way, if they say yes or no, for it to go to the next uh, uh, appeal level? And how much more time would he have to spend in that prison waiting? So that's uncertain. I, I mean, at any point, um, I believe that the defense could appeal the bail decision once they have not yet done so. Um, and perhaps they would, if this decision does not go in his favor, perhaps they would try again. But so far, um, what we've seen in the UK is not leniency towards him. I think they've, they've really thrown the book at him. So I wouldn't um, hold my breath hoping that the UK will decide to, to, be, uh, to, to respect sort of even human rights and humanitarian conditions in this regard. Um, in terms of the decision itself, it, it could be immediate on that day. We won't really know until that day what to expect. Um, sometimes you find out at the very end, they may, they may break for a short period and come back the same day, or they may state that, that something will be announced at a later date. Um, we'll have to see. But in terms of public awareness and in terms of the campaign, I will emphasize that I think there is still a very real risk of his extradition. Um, so although you know there, there was a lot of um, relief around the 4th of January decision, this is still a long battle ahead, I fear. Um, I very much hope that justice is served here, that this will be the end of it, that this court will uphold uh, the initial decision and that I don't believe there would be any legal grounds to keep him detained if this court finds, uh, again, that he should not be extradited. If he is, then there will be other steps that can be pursued. And it's not clear how quickly they might move 
um, to extradite him if that is the decision of this course. I, be I believe it would go back to the district court for a formality. I don't think that there would be an actual hearing, but there would be a decision, I think, of the district judge again if, if this court kicks it back to her. Um, I worry that given the political pressures in this case, um, I worry that we could see things move very speedily, um, but we'll have, we'll have to wait and see, I think, what happens on the 27th and 28th of October. Well, we're talking with uh, Rebecca Vincent. Do we only have a few minutes left? She's the director of international campaigns for Reporters Without Borders, known internationally as uh, Reporters Sans Frontiers. Uh, this has been a big case for RSF. I knew you are the director of, of, of international campaigns for reporters, but you yourself are focused on this one primarily. Haven't you been for the last year and a half? Are you really out there scattered in other cases? Did you really put a premium on this particular case because of its implications? Well, so I'm responsible for our, our top priority campaign. So I do work on others, but this is certainly one of our top global priorities. Um, and I made a point of personally monitoring as many of these proceedings as I could just because of the significance of it. Also because of the difficulty, I have to say, um, it, <laughs> I, I don't like to be told that I can't do my job. And so that made me even more determined, I think, to get in. And so I think that judge miscalculated if she thought that we would back down after that. And we were able to get in. Um, we were able to do our jobs. I felt a real responsibility in that regard because there weren't other monitors. I mean, there were media that were accredited and had access to the cloud video platform, but there weren't other NGOs like us at that point because everybody was denied this access so we were left. And when I saw that we were the only ones fighting to get in every day, I then did feel a real responsibility to make sure that we bore witness to this, that we documented the barriers to open justice that we witnessed. And I believe that this will all be historically important. Well, you know, I in those uh, three or four days that I was around you, I uh, so clear to me that you are dauntless and not easily intimidated. And you've been doing a great job. I follow you. Uh, and uh, it's very important that other people do. How do people uh, stay in contact with uh, Rebecca Vincent and RSF? Uh, well, I'm, I'm quite active on Twitter and I have my DMs open. So if people have questions on the case or um, you know want to, to find more information there, they can try me on Twitter. Um, we also use the RSF accounts to share our materials on the case. There is a wealth of information on our website because we have documented a lot of this and, and we do comment whenever there's a, a significant development on the case. So our website is www.rsf.org. You can do That's backslash it. Ian, backslash Ian for the English version, but rsf.org. Um, and if anybody's so inclined as well, there is a donate button there. We are really grateful for any, um, any donations there. I'll note that if you donate in GBP, British pounds, that does get earmarked specifically for the London Bureau, which is leading on this case. So it will go towards our efforts on this and, and other key global campaigns, which we run from here. I, I highly recommend uh, folks that you do that. Just say that again, uh, the uh, website. The website, www.rsf.org. If you want English straight away, backslash Ian, or you can click for different language versions on the website. And I do, people out there who have the money to spend, uh, this is a worthy cause. Uh, Rebecca and RSF have been just, um, relentless in, in pursuing a, a, a pleasurable outcome uh, to this uh, despicable uh, uh, Kafka-esque affair. Um, and, and to get you uh, personally on uh, Twitter is? Oh, I'm Rebecca underscore Vincent. So you can find me on there. And the Twitter handles for RSF, the international account, RSF underscore inter and RSF underscore English for, for our more English focused account. So yeah, folks, there are a lot of organizations, NGOs that uh, are, are in support of Assange, whether it be Amnesty International, I think Human Rights Watch is now on it and uh, many others. But Rebecca and her group are the only ones monitoring this and giving the information out. So I highly recommend that you support RSF and uh, particularly uh, the one in England because it goes to the Assange case. I, I, I appreciate everything that you do and everything that RSF does. Uh, any last thoughts? Give us your last summation here uh, before we cut out and listen to a little more Niels Melzer. Well, I think just that everybody can do something to help in this case by sharing accurate information on the case, by writing to their policymakers. Um, and any journalist listening now is really the time for solidarity, whether or not people have decided, you know, that Assange himself as a person is, is, is worth their efforts. 
this is really the future of journalism that is at stake. And again, it will not stop with Julian Assange. So anybody concerned about the future of journalism should certainly be vocal about this case now before it's too late. Thank you once again, uh, Rebecca Vincent. Uh, I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical, live on the fly here, Assange Countdown to Freedom. Uh, we're going to come back after uh, this little piece by Nils Melzer with the father of Julian Assange, John Shipton. We'll be right back. Once again, that was uh, Nils Melzer, and uh, that uh, tune there is uh, dedicated to his daughter, uh, Lenny, uh, for her birthday. He composed that uh, a few months back. By the way, I'm Randy Credico, Randy Credico Live on the Fly here on Progressive Radio Network, also on Roken. Uh, you can watch uh, this show later on today, um, and it's another edition of our special series, Assange Countdown to Freedom. And uh, as I mentioned just before we heard Mr. Uh, Melzer play the piano, uh, we are joined by uh, the father of Julian Assange, joining us uh, for the fourth or fifth time over the last year, uh, John Shipton. And it's great to uh, see and hear you uh, again, uh, John. Thank you, Randy. It's good to be back with you. Yeah, well, you got a little bit of a smile there, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're able to maintain um, some kind of uh, uh, humorous optimism here. Uh, it's not easy. It hasn't been easy. You've gone through the tortures of the damned uh, here. Um, you know, I was talking to uh, earlier with um, Rebecca Vincent uh, from Reporters Without Borders. She was there, and we talked about this. Uh, in um, in uh, Belmore's, the first half of last year's hearing uh, hearings, and uh, we were talking about you. I mean, there's a photo that I took of, of you and your son, and you're looking down at uh, your son Julian uh, during that uh, entire week. And I saw, you know, what what was going through your head during that period of time, and the, the you know, the entire week that you were there looking at him, going through what he was going through? Well, uh, most, mostly, Andy, you know, nil desperatum carburundum, don't let the bastards grind you down, is uh, what uh, goes through the head. And, and the greater the insult uh, that Julian faces in that show trial that you and I are at him, the later three-week hearing, which is amply documented by the great Craig Murray, what goes through your head is that the greater the insult, the harder you fight. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, you've been fighting. You've been out there. You've been uh, indefatigable uh, this, uh, since you first came on the scene a couple of years ago. Um, you've been uh, traveling. You traveled to the U.S. That's when I last saw you. But the first time, just... The first time was on, on the 24th of February, uh, 2020. And uh, I mean, um, you're watching your son, this brilliant man, nonviolent person, wouldn't swat a fly and uh, be treated so disrespectfully. Must, I, I, I know that you, you um, have disdain for the way they treat Julian, but uh, there must be a lot of pain inside when you see this happening to your own son. Well, it makes you angry. Uh, 
Uh, and, it, you know, Andy, I'm sorry, Randy, it just makes you really cross. Um, but uh, you, you have to contain your anger because the powers you're up against are gigantic, you know, as the UK, the, the Department of Justice in the United States, the State Department. These are not lightweight figures. And so if you just let your anger take hold of you, it crushes you rather than you able to put up a bit of a fight uh, to help Julian. So it crushes oneself. So you just contain your, your, your anger and you use that as an energy and that energy drives you forward and you just do whatever you can to get the boy out of the troubles and home to his kids and family. So that's how it works internally. That, that's how it works. Just as a further comment, the wars are over. The wars that the foundations of these charges are mounted on are over. They're finished. They're out of there. They left last week. And Julian, this case, staggers onward as though it's under the momentum of the Satan himself. Yes. It's, you know, getting, it's getting unbelievable. You've got to say to these people in charge of this prosecution, shake your head, fellas. Wake up. Smell the coffee. The sunrise. The wars are finished. Right. The cause. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, go no, on. You're right. I mean, I, I, they showed a video of him from 2010 uh, talking about uh, uh, the war in Afghanistan, and uh, and he called it right. This was, uh, you know, washing tax dollars and putting them into the hands of those who, I don't know if we lost a war. We may have lost a war on paper, but they certainly did not. Those those uh, defense companies certainly profited heavily uh, off well, of those. I don't think of it in terms of loss in the sense that people go on about. You know, the American people, and we met many of them in, in uh, touring 17 cities of the United States last month. The American people won. The war's over. No more of their kids are going to be shot. No more of their treasure is going to be poured into uh, Burger King uh, portable refrigerators going on to C-17s to come back to the United States. It's right. finished. Right. The, United, the, the people of the United States prevailed. Right. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's just uh, remarkable how long we were there and how many people died, how many people uh, were killed, not just by the U.S., but this... Uh, this uh, very uh, weird coalition of countries that got in on the action, including uh, where he's being held right now, Julian, and that is in the UK. I mean, they lost lives and, and they destroyed lives at the same time. And so they're out of there as well. Yeah, the, 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 the good fortune that the revelations of uh, Chelsea Manning and the public of Times and WikiLeaks, the good fortune brought to those countries involved in a crime. The people remove their support. The institutions, of course, groan and moan about, them, like, for example, that uh, unmentionable man, what's his name? Tony Blair, a name that uh, uh, one spends a bit of time forgetting. <laughs> Tony Blair saying, that it's imbecilic to remove the troops. Well, they try and convince that to 500 million people uh, in the West, Western nations. They're delighted that the war's over. We celebrated that the war's over. It's just a, a, a marooned figures like Tony Blair, who, sounds, who his preference is to stand atop of a pyramid of skulls, and from that position, say, I want more war. Yeah, it's not sane people. They're not sane people, Randy. Yeah, you but, can't take no notice of them. All you can take notice of is us, yeah. us, the people. 
who have removed our support for these wars and they're finished. Well, you know, he lied, uh, you know, as Bush lied, uh, and, and he uh, deceived the British uh, public and the, I mean, the entire UK public uh, sending troops over there uh, way back then there and in Iraq, Tony Blair, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, there was uh, some talk about it and some motion on it that he sh he's the one that should be on trial, not Julian Assange. Absolutely. I mean, he's stating that it's the, the Saddam and Iraq are 45 minutes away from being able to destroy London with OMDs, despite the fact that the United Nations reporter investigating there couldn't find any WMDs. And the, the United States and the United Kingdom couldn't find any WM weapons of mass destruction after they invaded the place. Nobody apologizes. He wants to stay there despite the fact that he's ruined the lives of 26 million people and been involved in the murder of millions. Yes. In the murder of millions of people. And this moron stands atop his pyramid of skulls and says, we've got to stay in there fighting more. He, he wants more. So it's, well, it's good for uh, BE and other, other uh, defense contractors in the UK uh, that have profited uh, heavily. I think it's going to take them 20 years just to count the profits. Uh, that <laughs> yes. I mean, the, the river of money that they've taken away from schools and hospitals and roads and bridges in the United States and the United Kingdom is staggering. It's a 20-year project of $3 trillion that the uh, current administration of the United States is trying to get through Congress to fix up the mess. Do, what kind of impact do you think this might have right now, uh, this Afghanistan, this dovetailing in with the, um, with the, uh, the high court uh, coming up uh, with their decision, possibly uh, October 27th or 28th? Uh, do, you, do you think they might be influenced by the fact that Julian basically spelled it out for us? He exposed what went on in both countries. Uh, do you think that might have, these guys might look at it and see, my, my government was lying here. Tony Blair was lying. Jack Straw was lying. Uh, or is the fix in at, at this particular level before it gets on to uh, the Supreme Court? in the UK? Uh, I, I don't know. You know, when I rattle off the judges that have been involved in Julian's persecution, say Phillips, uh, Lord Phillips notably taking the French language interpretation of the European arrest warrant system over the English language interpretation of the European arrest warrant, which was considered by Parliament. So that sort of pretzel logic that Lord Phillips decided that Julian ought to be extradited. And then you have Arbuthnot, Judge Arbuthnot, who in a callous outburst, an elated callous outburst, said if Julian wants a bit of sunshine, he should go out on the balcony. <laughs> Right, when well, he had a vaccination. Seven uh, years in, in a room. I mean, this is a, or, or Judge Taylor uh, uh, saying that, uh, you know, five minutes after Julian was dragged out of the embassy, saying that uh, Julian was a narcissist, you know, using that sort of psychological language when one thought he was a lawyer and he didn't even have a profile of Julian on his, on, on his desk in front of him. They just go on and on with it. Right. Um, uh, uh, Baraitza, uh, uh, as you witnessed, an uh, unsympath unsympathetic partisan judge you couldn't wish to see, you know, like she was just there for the defense, for the prosecution. Yeah, it just it, goes on now. Whether they can realize that they're insulated themselves from the reality of a historical change 
of the ending of two wars by the revelations of Chelsea Manning and publications of Julian Assange, if they manage to allow that historical reality to penetrate the insulation that they've undergone, they will say, Julian, go home. Right, certainly. That's pretty clear. We're talking if, about if they to wish to add to their prestige as lawyers and judges and add to the prestige, the declining prestige of the administration of law in the United Kingdom, they'll simply say, Julian, you best go home. Right, right. That certainly would be great. Uh, but, you know, let's look at this. And by the way, Judge Baratzer, uh, you know, the... Uh, those big uh, icebergs that are missing uh, up there in the North Pole, I think uh, somehow swim in her veins uh, because uh, she, I watched her. I've never seen anyone as cold as that person. Uh, although she was very warm uh, to the prosecution, the CPS and their uh, puppeteer sitting behind them uh, from Alexandria, Virginia, those three uh, young kids basically in their, uh, you know, their nylon suits uh, calling the shots. Uh, I, I want, uh, let's, let's talk about Julian and uh, his uh, particular uh, state of mind right now. Have you spoken to him uh, recently? Yeah, last, a couple of weeks ago, we were uh, chatting, but since that decision has been made, they've had their heads down um, trying to, you know, trying to build a defence. I believe they've got a new lawyer. I don't know his name yet. I'll let you know when I find out. Um, and so they're desperately, or sort of vigorously, uh, putting together a, a new uh, defence and attack. The, the situation is that the counter uh, appeal by the defence by Julian's lawyers can't be heard until the uh, October 27th hearing of the American appeal is heard. So that's the, the circumstance as far as I know, yeah. Well, well, well just for the uh, people out there listening, uh, you, you spoke to a couple of weeks ago, uh, and uh, there's all sorts of speculation that, uh, you know, his health is bad, his mental health is bad. Uh, people, you know, I don't know what to believe out there. So let's get it from somebody that actually spoke to him. Oh, you know, he, he, Julian is uh, resilient. You know, it, it, he's not the best, but mentally he's a f fighting for his life. So... Uh, you know, as they say, the hangman's noose always sharpens the mind. Right. Um, so that circumstance that if he's sent to the United States, it will be the end of him. Right. It keeps his mind sharp as the circumstances will allow. Right. So um, so uh, right now they're, they're putting together uh, uh, a potential uh, uh, counter appeal. Uh, to the, uh, which was 99% of that decision by Judge Baratzer back January 4th, was it, um, uh, w w w was bad. You know what I mean? She agreed with everything and then she throws him a bone and says, but we're not going to send you there because your mental health is not, uh, is not conducive to those uh, circumstances. Yet, at the same time, she sends him back to this medieval squalid dangerous dungeon called Belmorish. Yeah, but it's hard to, to know what, what these people, you know, where their humanity is. I mean, do they take their kids to the pictures or, or do they do they take the, their kids down, down the park to roll in cactuses? You know, it's really hard to understand where their humanity lives. They just put on their wigs and robes and come in and sit in that big desk up the front there and abandon all compassion and understanding of humanity. You remember, Andy, uh, sorry, Randy. No, I remember? take both names. Some people call me Andy, some people oh, call yeah, me yeah. Andy. I'm just speaking quickly. Just don't call yourself. me Bambi. 
<laughs> you remember, Randy, in the court case, and you witnessed this yourself, that Julian was in a glass box at the back cage. We're showing that right to, now as we speak, yes. To speak to his lawyers, he had to get on his knees and whisper through a crack. His lawyers had to stand in their tiptoes and put their ear against the, the crack in the glass. This is absurd. They asked for permission for Julian, like all other prisoners do, to sit with, at the bar table with his defence lawyer, but this refused. I mean, I'll just give one example. Another example is in a particular hearing with Judge Taylor, Julian couldn't remember his name and couldn't immediately remember his birthday. This circumstance is in Australia, never ever would a judge take a plea from a person in that condition, ever. It just doesn't happen. And yet Taylor uh, 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 takes a plea from Julian. And it just goes on and on. There's the, the documented, the documented, if I'm not making this stuff up, the documented conspiracy between the Crown Prosecuting Service and the Swedish Prosecuting Authority to keep Julian in the embassy. Right. And you got the... It's you extraordinary. Got the... To keep him in the embassy, they conspired together to flout laws, regulations, uh, and uh, uh, and due process. Also, let's, let, let's let's not forget. Uh, you know, you see global spying on <laughs> him, on his lawyers, on journalists like Stefani Morizzi. Uh, that alone should uh, be grounds to uh, dismiss this case. And then you got the witness that just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I don't know, three or four weeks ago uh, from Iceland who recanted his testimony. So you have all this stuff coming up and I know more is coming up. I, I know for a fact there'll be more uh, explosive, uh, uh, you know, information coming out here on this. Uh, so you would think all this stuff cumulatively uh, would definitely be enough to blow this case up, but somehow they are staying in the trenches, all of these different judges, and basically, you know, they're doing the bidding of, of the powers that be in both countries. Yeah, it's, it, it's, like, you, it's like there, I think there is a, a, a television show or, or uh, got on a a ship and the ship just sailed on and they repeated over and over again the circumstances for each day and the ship sails on. But that the the Crown Prosecuting Services simply has that that uh, odor. <laughs> I can't say anything other than it's an odor. Yeah. You know, so the the, the circumstances like the wars are gone. Guantanamo Bay is on the, on the cusp of being closed. The circumstances of the persecution of Julian over the 12 years, one irregularity after another. So the only way that those people can come and put on their robes and sit at the judge's desk is to ignore the reality that surrounds them. As a consequence, they bring themselves and the administration of justice in the United Kingdom into utter disgrace. Exactly. Well, I totally agree with that. Uh, and, and speaking of uh, the smell that the uh, CPS has, I think uh, anyone that goes into that courtroom, mass, heavy mass should be mandatory uh, yeah. whiff of it because it is uh, nearly lethal. I, you know, I could smell it through that uh, bulletproof uh, plexiglass that we were sitting behind uh, that uh, first time around at Belmores. We have uh, two minutes left, uh, John. Uh, tell me what you've got coming up and uh, any last thoughts about this? Uh, well, we've got uh, um, 
there's so much happening. Stefania Moritz has brought out a book which will come out in English. It's already published in Italian that, that addresses all of the, uh, the revelations in the, in the FOIs from the United Kingdom and Sweden. Then this uh, Nils Melzer's book is coming out in English uh, uh, in February. Again, it will be updated to include the October 27th, 28th and 29th hearing. We'll be over in England. I hope to see you there again uh, on the 27th, 28th, 29th for the, uh, that, that particular hearing. Then we have uh, a tour of the United States coming up next year. And uh, just before that, a tour of the United Kingdom. Um, there's a, a film uh, by Eugene Jarecki coming out, uh, the, uh, a, a profile of Julian and the circumstances of his persecution, and a film by Gabrielle Shipton, as you know, uh, you were involved in it. Um, and that's coming out in May next year. So there's lots and lots doing. And the I momentum of information after, after the, the people of the United States won the war in Afghanistan. We've got to keep that in mind over and over and over again. It wasn't lost. The people of the United States won the war. They removed their support for participation in the destruction of Afghanistan and the spending of their treasure and the lives of their children on this war. Well, That's got to be just said over and over again. Well, the people of the United States won the war in Afghanistan. Well, uh, I, I think that's a good uh, note to go out on. I, I doubt if I'll see you on the uh, uh, 27th because uh, what's happened to Craig Murray, uh, contempt charges, Oh, I, and allegedly, oh, well, yeah, the yeah, one that yeah. took some pictures there uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. at the Belmore's yeah. trial, and I don't want to, you know, end up uh, in, in, in a room with Craig uh, for contempt of court. But who knows? I may go out there. I, I was really planning on it. I'll have to uh, check out with some uh, uh, some smart British lawyers. Thanks again, uh, John Shipton. Um, we'll be seeing you soon, I hope, and uh, you're welcome back here. We will continue this program. It's uh, Radio Critical Live on the Fly, but it's the Assange Countdown to Freedom, uh, now well into our fifth year, and we will just keep going and keep going and uh, until uh, Julian is uh, out, and uh, we can interview him here with you and uh, Gabriel. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, Thank we'll you. Talk to you. Thank uh, you. We're going to go out now. Uh, once again, this is Nils Melzer, uh, his uh, version of uh, Moonlight Sonata, uh, see you next week at the same time here on Progressive Radio Network and also uh, on Roken. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>